Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. Today we have Marika Asgari, who is a senior postdoc at Edinburgh University. She'll be talking today about the, the recent Kids 1000 Cosmology results. They also did an excellent webinar when they released the results. So if you don't get enough from this talk, you can go and watch their webinar, which I'll link to in the description. The results today, like many cosmology results nowadays, mostly confirm that Lambda CDM seems to be getting things right when you compare CMV to local measurements. But there is, like in a lot of other cosmological results nowadays, a small lingering tension, which is interesting. And I'm sure Marika will go into it in more detail. So thanks for, for coming along for the talk. Marika, do you want to tell us about the recent papers? Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about two of the five papers that we submitted recently. So one of them is cosmic shear paper, where we measured the cosmic shear signal from the kilodegree survey and analyzed it to set constraints on the parameters of the standard model. And then the second one is combining the cosmic shear signal with the galaxy clustering and their cross correlation that galaxy galaxy lensing. And again, setting constraints on parameters of lambda CDM. For both of these, uh, we also check the internal consistency of the data and the consistency or inconsistency with luck. So if people are remembering this talk a few months after having watched it and there are only two things that they remember, what would those two things be that you want them to remember? I'll give you one per paper maybe. So for the cosmic shear paper, I want people to remember that our data is robust against all the systematics that we could think of and that our errors are statistics dominated instead of being systematic dominated. And for the combined probe analysis, when we do the combined probe, we can break the degeneracy between sigma 8 and omega m that exists in cosmic shear. And then with that, we see that the three sigma tension that we have with Planck is driven by sig value of sigma eight rather than any other parameter. Why did you do the, these specific analyses? What is the background? Why did Kids 1000 do this particular measurement? Why did Kids 1000 get funded in the first place? And why is it these particular types of measurements so why galaxy share and things that you are able to do? So there is a long history about Kids. I don't think I'd, there's time to go into what happened with the survey in total, in general. But uh, if I just want to talk about cosmic shear in general, I would say that its strength is that it rather directly measures the amount of matter compared to like say, surveys that use uh, galaxy positions. So they rely on bias traces. So that's like the strength of cosmic shear is that um, and in particular kids, which I will go in a little bit more detail about, is a unique survey in that we have a good uh, handle on the systematics in the survey because it was designed as a weak cleansing survey. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let, let's get into the, into the details. What, what have you guys done? What are the results? Okay, so I'll just start from the first page. So KIT stands for the Kilo Degree Survey. And what we analyzed was a thousand square degrees of it. And this map here, mass maps here, are uh, basically showing the footprint of kids. Uh, we have a stripe that's equatorial, it's called Kids North, and then another one that is in the Southern Hemisphere. And this image in the bottom is uh, showing uh, telescopes in parallel, and one of them is uh, the Kids one. Don't ask me which one. So this is an artist impression, so it, they don't actually go through the Milky Way and they're not next to each other either, these uh, stripes here. Yeah. The papers that I told you at the start, these are the five papers. I'll talk about the first two, but the three others uh, come as companion papers with them. So the first three came together and then the last two uh, came out about a month ago. So I'm not gonna talk about these ones today, but if you have questions, please ask me. Okay, so just like a Cosmic Share 101, what are we actually measuring? So we're measuring shapes of galaxies in cosmic shear. And what happens is that the light of a galaxy that's far away passes by large scale structure, it gets distorted, and then what we measure is a distorted image of the galaxy. Now, if you have two galaxies and their light passes by a similar structure, then they get similarly distorted and their shapes get a correlation. So, and this correlation is what we measure. This is our primary signal. So it all seems quite easy. 
So let's see how it works in practice. Okay, so in practice, first of all, uh, the signal is very weak. So the only way we can measure it is by stacking a lot of galaxies together. So uh, millions of galaxies, so we need high resolution and deep images. And then we need to be able to identify the objects in the images and make an object catalog. At the same time, we do the observations in multi-bands, so to get colors for these objects. And the colors are first used to divide the objects into stars and galaxies. And this is important for two reasons. First of all, well, you don't want to mix up your stars and galaxies because the galaxies are the ones that are being shared. And secondly, to get the correct shapes for the galaxies, we need to correct for the effect of atmosphere. And for that, we use the stars to model this effect. And then from the multiband images, we can also get an estimate of the redshift of the galaxies. Okay, but these shapes are not perfect. So um, to calibrate them, we use image simulations that have all the effects that are in the actual images to calibrate these. And also the redshifts are not perfect. And for that, uh, to calibrate them, we uh, use overlapping spectroscopic galaxies and then try to match their colors with the galaxies that we have in the survey to calibrate the overall redshift distribution of the galaxies. Okay, then you might divide your galaxies into redshift bins because that would increase your constraints and use the shapes to correlate them to, uh, with your favorite statistics, usually two-point statistics, and then you get your signal. So now you've got your signal, but you need to do your modeling. And for the modeling, you can use analytical models like HALO model. And for that, as an input, you need the redshift distribution of galaxies. And that's because if a galaxy is further away, if light passes by more matters, therefore be expected to be lensed more. So we need to know this quite accurately. So you also need your, to model your errors. So you have your signal, your error, and your prediction from theory, which you can also get from simulations. So basically, once you have these three, you can get your likelihood. But before you can continue, you have to add the impact of nuisance parameters. And that's because our signal is not just cosmology. There are other things that affect it. So it could be astrophysical effects, or it could be systematics that come in through these two steps, basically. And then finally, you can get your cosmology. Okay, so you have the full picture here. Uh, but is it the full picture? So this is another factor and that's the blinding. So we take blinding very seriously in kids because we don't want to fiddle with the different knobs here to get the cosmology we want. In this picture, what does the blinding do? At what stage of this is the noise or randomness added? Personally, I didn't go into the details of how the blinding is done because if you know how the blinding is done, then it's easy to unblind yourself. Right, right. So, yeah, okay. But I, I, what I know is that there are three sets of catalogs, so shapes, basically. And uh, one of them is the truth, two or fake. But I don't know how they're made, and I didn't ask. Oh yeah, no, that's that's very morally upright of you. I I, I would be very tempted <laughs> to to try and unblind it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I thought I might try to do it, that's why I didn't ask. Okay, basically. all right. I know that you want to know the motivation of why we're doing this. So this is one my my one slide on the theory and what I think about it. So we have the standard cosmological model. It's currently flat on the CPM. Uh, we really like this model. Why? Because it's simple. A handful of parameters can capture its essence. And also, although it's simple, it's been very successful in explaining observations from various different epochs and scales, from CMD to geometric probes like supernova and large-scale structures and so on. And now the question is, if this model is so great and so simple, why are we still doing cosmology? And I think it's a fair answer, uh, question, but uh, I can give two answers to it. Firstly, we want to know the exact value of these parameters with more accuracy. And then secondly, this model, although it's simple, it's not very physical, in my opinion, because two of its main components are dark. So it's a little bit phenomenological, I would say. So then we started doing precision cosmology, 
and started seeing cracks in this simple, perfect model. Now you know that the largest tension is now between the measurements of hover constant from the sense ladder and the CMB. And it's interesting that these two measurements are also from the most far apart from each other in epoch as well. So I think it's not, it maybe it's not a coincidence that this is the case. Uh, and if these two were the only ones that are discrepant, then we could say that one or both of them did a mistake, right? But it's not the only ones. And there are others that have some tension, yeah, but maybe not as exciting and as large. And this is the motivation for doing this, basically. Okay, so I'll give you a few key facts about the kit. As I said, it's a weak lensing specific survey, so it has exquisite images. And we've analyzed a thousand square degrees of it with 21 million galaxies. All the observations are done. It's 1,350 square degrees now, but it hasn't been analyzed yet. And uh, one of the important aspects of KIDS is that when combined with its sister survey, Viking, they have nine photometric bands. And this is very important for being able to accurately estimate the photometric redshifts and calibrate them. I presume Viking hasn't done a thousand square degrees with 21 million galaxies though? Is it just some sort of subset for calibration or? No, all of them. So KIDS was, I think, designed to follow Viking's footprint. So we would have all the bands. So let's go to the results now. First, I'll talk about the cosmic shear paper. For the cosmic shear paper, we did our analysis with three sets of two-point statistics. So all of these two-point statistics can be derived from two-point correlation functions. These are the correlation functions of the shear. And in this plot on the top, you see psi plus, and the bottom, you see psi minus. And this is a massive data vector, but it's because we deployed our data into tomographic bins. So bin one being the lowest bin, and then bin five being the highest bin. And you see here that for bin one, the signal to noise is much lower than bin five, because bin five galaxies are further away. And then on top of that, you have the theory curve, which includes the standard flatland residue model and the nuisance parameters. So the nuisance parameters are two groups. You have the astrophysical ones, that's the intrinsic alignments of galaxies, and also the effect of barren feedback that impacts mostly smaller scales. And then we have some nuisance parameters for uh, the calibration as well, so the uncertainty in the calibration for photometric redshifts and the shear calibration. And what was the difference between psi plus and psi minus? So uh, basically because shear is a polar, so it has two components, you can produce two sets of correlations from it. Now because we did this analysis with three two-point statistics, I want to just introduce them. So as I said, all of them can be measured from the two-point correlation functions, but for their theory, we can directly measure them from power spectra. So here in this equation, this is a statistic, and this is equal to an integral over the power spectrum. So this is the angular power spectrum, that's uh, the lensing power spectrum, and then with a weight function. And this weight function depends on the statistic. So I want to show you what's the sensitivity of each of these statistics to scales, to L scales. So first set of statistics is the correlation functions or two-point correlation functions to PCFs. So there's a psi plus up here, psi minus down here, and I'm showing the integrands of each of them. So you can see what's the response to the different L scales. And psi plus here, you can see that it mixes a lot of different scales together. Uh, so its kernels are very broad. And psi minus, its kernels are not as broad, but it tends to get information from higher scales where we don't have a very good handle on the modeling. That's one of the reasons other statistics were used and developed. So here we have another one, it's called Kusebis. This is complete orthogonal sets of EP integrals. You're not gonna remember that part of it, just remember Kusebis maybe. So again, showing the integrands, and here you see that the Cassavis kernel is much narrower. Uh, so the Cassavis were designed to be able to separate E modes from B modes. In cosmic shear, we don't only expect to get E modes from lensing, and B modes, if they exist, uh, usually point to some 
it's residual systematic. And that's why it's important to be able to separate them for the data analysis. So that was their main goal, but they also have other benefits like not being sensitive to high L where we can't model things very well. Um, just a quick question. The, this theta parameter in the ordinary correlation functions, I guess that's trying to define some sort of smoothing scale. Is that right? So theta is the angular distance between two galaxies that are correlated with each other. So, so if it's a 0.5, it's like all the pairs of galaxies that are close to each other, 300 the ones that are further away. That's, that's what it means. And uh, this actually 0.5 and 300 or 4 and 300 are the range of scales that we use in our analysis. And then lastly, we have another one which is called band powers. This is the one that's closest to Fourier analysis. So it's basically trying to be uh, like a bind power spectrum. And we have eight bands. You can see the kernels here. Just thinking about the Cosebis, so then the n parameter in the Cosebis is just an index. It doesn't pick out a particular scale or anything. Yeah, it's just an index. And so the final results use a specific n or they, they kind of average over all n's or...? So uh, we use one to five. That's because when you add more uh, ends, you don't really add more cosmological information. So it does uh, data compression as well. Okay, so, and this, you've got yeah. in a square gr brackets, 0 0.5 to 300. Saying something about angles, but what, what is it, how does it work into the mathematics? So basically, Kusevis are designed to separate EB modes, but given a finite angular range for side plus and side minus. And that's important also because some of the other methods that try to do that, they take integrals over these two here. That is not finite. So it can go from zero to infinity or something like that. Uh, but we can't measure side plus side minus from zero to infinity. So Kusevis also does that. So there's no mixing of E and B modes because you don't have all the angles. So here we've defined the Kusevis over 0.5 to 300 odd minutes. So band power is again similar. So again, they, you need some angular range because uh, these band powers are not measured from a Fourier transform. So they're measured from the real space correlation functions. And again, you have to cut the correlation functions at some scale because you can't go beyond that. So this is what this range means here. Okay, so we have these three basically. And now let's look at the results. All right, so this is a headline plot, basically. Uh, so here we see the cosmic banana in sigma 8 and omega m. Uh, and this degeneracy exists because we cannot tell between a universe that has a lot of matter, but this matter is not very clustered, or one that has a little matter that's super clustered with each other. And here we have uh, orange is Kosebis, pink is band powers, and cyan is two-point correlation functions. And then the plank contour is this little one here. But because we have this uh, degeneracy, we usually look at this other parameter called S8, which is a combination of omega and sigma 8 that's supposed to be almost perpendicular to the banana. And um, here now the degeneracy between S8 and omega m is much less than sigma 8 and omega m. And you can see that the contours are kind of separated from each other here. And in this uh, S8 parameter, we have about a three sigma tension with Planck. So it's kind of getting exciting, I guess. And, and of course, the other two similar studies to kids DES and is it HSC? Is that right? Yes. They, they both, they, they may not have as much tension, but they also both lie below Planck, which is, of course, very yes. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you combine them, you get something more significant. Yeah. So if I go back here, you see that for band powers and Kusebis, this uh, definition of S8 it doesn't capture the perpendicular direction di um, perfectly because it's still tilted. So um, we define this other parameter called capital sigma 8. It's been used previously in cosmic machine analysis, but it has a different power. And the power is um, fitted to the contours such that it is uh, more perpendicular. And you can see the value of alpha for each of these statistics here. So this one is the correlation functions, this blue one. So each of the panels is following one of the statistics. 
in the top row is uh, the Planck results. So this is the primary anisotropy of Planck. So it doesn't have CMB lensing in it. And the next three are our results. So one thing to notice here is that the size of the error bars for Planck and our results in this parameter are quite comparable. Okay. And then uh, the second thing is that in this parameter, which is more perpendicular uh, for our fiducial analysis, we have a 3.4 sigma tension. Is it easy to explain why, like if you go back to your previous slide, the Planck contours were tiny compared to the kids ones. Why, why is it that then when you go to the sigma eight parameter that they end up with the same error bar size? Is that something that can be kind of explained in a few sentences or is it too subtle? No, I think if you look at this side, you can see it. So it's basically the length of this contour versus the length of this one. And they are pretty much the same. Okay, so um, we also wanted to see what's the impact of the nuisance parameters on our analysis. So we choose uh, different setups to test. Uh, this number 5 to 12 are the impact of observational systematics and so maybe the shear, uh, shear calibration uncertainty and the redshift calibration uncertainty. And then number 13 and 14 are the astrophysical ones. You have the barium feedback and the intrinsic alignment. And here, there's, there are no surprises here. So there's a little bit of fluctuation when everything is within what we expect. Normally, one is always concerned a little bit about a kind of look elsewhere effect when you play with slightly different parameterizations and then get a bigger tension. But it seems to me like it's not quite so relevant here because if you had changed the parameters from sigma 8 to S8 to capital sigma 8 in order to maximize the tension, then of course, yeah, all right. So you go from 2.5 to 3 sigma, that's no surprise, and one shouldn't be excited about the 3 sigma. But it seems like you've done something else. You've just said what we're interested in is finding the parameter that kids constrains the most accurately. And then it just so happens that that also increases the tension. But in principle, it could have decreased the tension. Is that a fair summary? So I guess it depends on where the tension's coming from. So if, if you imagine that, say, like, just, just simplify it and say that kids can only measure one parameter and all the other parameters are prior dominated. So like you have this multi-dimensional parameter space, if you then project it for this other parameters that we cannot constrain, as long as the prior range matches with the, prior, uh, the values that Planck finds, we're going to find agreement. It's only when we look at the parameter that we have constraints that we will find disagreement, basically. I guess what I'm trying to ask is whether I need to do an internal calibration that I should have expected the degree of tension to increase, in which case it's not that exciting, or it could have gone either way, in which case the fact that it increased the tension is actually pointing more aggressively towards it being tension. And, and, and it sounds like it is the second one. So it's, it's not really calibration is defining this parameter, capital sigma A. It's just like a projection of the parameter space into one parameter that uh, we can set the tightest constraints on. So it's not really calibration in that sense, yeah. Just to dwell a tiny little bit further, I guess the, the, the crucial thing that makes me realize that this isn't subject to a look elsewhere effect is that you, you could have not even known the Planck data and you'd have settled yes. on exactly the same capital sigma eight. So yeah. there's no way at all that this could be accidentally done to maximize the tension because it's actually no. just within the mm -hmm. kids data. So in that sense, the fact that the tension has gotten bigger is actually to me a really interesting thing. I told you about number five to 14 and then 15 to 20, we're looking at what happens if you remove one of the tomographic bins from the analysis. And this is to see if they are all consistent with each other. So 15 to 18 is looking at the first three bins and these three bins don't have as much signal to noise as the higher bins. And you can see that there isn't much change really. And then if you remove bin four and five where there is more signal to noise, you get a bigger shift. And this should be expected generally because they have most of the signal to noise. So they should fluctuate more basically. But we also went and did a 
full Bayesian analysis, removing each pin and then comparing it with the result of the rest of them and also seeing if it is consistent within all of them together. And they found that pin four and five are perfectly fine, but pin two is the weird one. But then if you look at here, you see that pin two is not really doing anything. So we kept it in, we didn't throw it out at the end. I guess a plot like this shows to me why it's so important to blind yourself because it's so easy to look at this. And if, if you're convinced Lambda CDM is correct, be like, oh, there must be something fishy in bin four. Um, yeah. But of course, bin five is pulling you in the other direction. So like, wh wh why why would you be more worried about bin four than bin five? And, and as you've pointed out, there are only one sigma. So the data is all completely consistent. But yeah, like it, it's so yeah. important to blind yourself so that you don't look at bin four and be like, ah, oh, we must have done something. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the last plot I'm going to show for the cosmic shear paper. So now here we're comparing with the previous cosmic shear results that you mentioned. These are in green. So the number four is the results from the previous kids analysis that was with 450 square degrees. And then number five is combining that with the uh, dark energy year one results. And then six and seven are dark energy year one and hyper year one results. And as we mentioned before, these results are all on one side of Planck. But you can also see here that our results are consistent with each other, with the 3.3 statistics, and also they're consistent with the previous results. So they're kind of set in the middle of all of them. So it seems like there is something strange maybe happening with either Lambda CDM or the Planck results. With, with the Planck results, you said that this doesn't include lensing, which I think makes sense to me because lensing is a low redshift late universe effect. If one had a nine with just Planck lensing, does it constrain S8 very well? And do you know where it would lie? So it doesn't constrain S8 very well because its degeneracy is quite different. So it kind of would lie somewhere from here to here. So it will basically be friends with everyone here. But if you overplot the uh, contours with in sigma eight and omega m, which I think there is a plot in the uh, Planck paper with the previous kids results, then you see that uh, lensing, CMB lensing is in agreement with both of them. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the second paper, that's the combined probes paper. So cosmic shear, as I said, is the correlation between shapes of galaxies but we could also use the positions of galaxies to trace the matter distribution. So the galaxies are bias traces of matter, but it can, can still be used and that gives you galaxy clustering. Or you can cross correlate the shapes and the positions to get the third probe as galaxy galaxy lens. And this is a shape of a background galaxy with a position of a four. And what happens if we do that? Uh, let me just first show you what is the data we actually use. So we obviously use kits for the lensing part of it. And that's uh, this pink and orangey stripes here. And then for the clustering, we use BOSS DR12. These are the big blue bits here. And for galaxy galaxy lensing, we use the overlap with BOSS in uh, kids north stripe and the overlap with 2DF lens, which is another spectroscopic survey in the south. And so the, again, the data vector is shown here. So this, for this, this analysis, we use the band powers. We didn't do it with all three of them. Can I ask a quick stupid question? The reason you need to use spectroscopic surveys to do this is because the photometric redshifts of kids alone doesn't tell you the position along the line of sight accurately enough. Is that the reason? Yeah. Yes. So you could use something like LRGs where the photometric redshift estimation is much more accurate. And this is one of the plans for Kids Legacy to do something like this. But for now, this is what we had and it has more signal to noise actually, if you use BOSS. Okay, so use band powers for the cosmic shear part of it. And then added uh, for the clustering, we use this anisotropic galaxy clustering, these um, real space correlations from Sanchez et al. It's basically the same measurement and same pipeline as Sanchez et al. And uh, importantly here, we basically have nonlinear galaxy bias model because we're measuring smaller scales as well. So we need to include that. And these are wedges. 
So you have three wedges based on if the galaxy, the two galaxies are parallel to the line of sight or transverse or something like that. So these are the three lines here you see. And then the final component, galaxy-galaxy lensing, the data is shown here. This is again band powers. And you have two lenses from BOSS and 2 df lens, and the five sources are these galaxies we used for cosmic shear, basically. The same, same, same bins. And you can cross-correlate them to get these measurements here. But we don't use the gray region for different reasons. If you want, I can elaborate on that. I have another stupid question about the S1 to 5 bins. I thought that they were based on redshift, but now it looks like there's quite a bit of overlap between the blue, the green, etc. So, so what is it that decides something is in a blue bin and decides something's in a green bin if it's not just redshift? So that's a good question. So basically, we have an estimate of galaxy redshift, single galaxy redshifts, using EPZ. If you've heard of that, so it's a program that does uh, some sort of Bayesian modeling and compares the spectral uh, distribution of the galaxy to the ones that it has. So it tries to match them and find a best fit, basically. And that gives you this best fit redshift. And we use that to separate galaxies into these bins. And this is these color bands here. But because this is biased, the galaxies are not actually just in this. And then that's why we need to do the calibration. And then once we do the spectroscopic calibration, you see that, uh, okay, a lot of them are in this band, but some of them are not. Ah, yeah, okay. So, so the spinning is done by photometric redshift, and then these histograms are done by spectroscopic redshift. Yeah. If you want to briefly say why you don't use the gray stuff, that would be, that'd be nice. There are two reasons. One is that you sometimes have too many galaxies that are in front of your lenses. So say, for example, for this case, you have L2 is here, and then S2 is here. So most of the galaxies are actually in front of the lens, so they shouldn't be lensed by the lenses, right? So any signal you see here is going to be dominated by intrinsic alignments. And intrinsic alignment modeling for this kind of configurations is quite difficult. So um, we decided to just uh, get rid of this, basically. And then uh, for these ones where you don't have that much overlap, so like L1's here, S5 is here, so there, isn't that, there aren't that many galaxies that are in front of the lenses. We cut the higher L, so smaller scales, where uh, the galaxy bias modeling is not reliable anymore because the model is based on perturbation theory, so it can't go very high. Either. Let's see what happens if you combine the probes. Now again, looking at S8, in uh, pink you have a cosmic shear resolves, that's band powers. And then if you combine that with galaxy galaxy lensing, you get the purple. It's not very different from the pink because we had to throw away most of the data basically. It helps a little bit with intrinsic alignment modeling, but it doesn't add very much really. And then almost perpendicular to them, you have the galaxy clustering from BOSS. So that's the blue one. And then if you combine all three, you get the red one. And now you can see that Planck results in gray here is again separated from our combined results. And this is again a three sigma tension basically. Now we can look at other parameters as well. We don't have to just look at S8 and omega m. Now let's look at sigma 8, h and omega m. And here in this plot, you can see that omega m matches between the two, but it is mainly sigma 8 that doesn't. So you can look at this one, for example. This is the sigma 8 1D marginals. And then if you look at H, which is of interest to a lot of people, we don't have very tight constraints on H. So it's mainly prior dominated, so we can't really say anything. So this tension is not really driven by H or omega m. Now, we've been looking at the tension in one parameter generally, but if you look at all the parameters that are shared between Planck and our analysis, then you get something like a two sigma tension. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about. You have this massive parameter space, and it depends on which way you're looking at it. 
Now, if you think about if your tension is just in one parameter, if you add other parameters where you don't have very good constraints on, that's just going to dilute your signal, basically. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I don't think necessarily that means that the most fair thing to say is that the actual tension is two sigma. The reason one would worry about the 3.1 being larger is if there was a look elsewhere effect. If you had your multidimensional parameter space and then you deliberately chosen the one direction where the most tension was, then I think, yeah, okay, you, you shouldn't care about the 3.1 and you should care about the two sigma. But if you've got a multidimensional parameter space and then for physical reasons, you say, I only care about S8 or I care more about S8 and that just happens to have mm -hmm. a bigger tension, then I think that's a way more interesting um, mm -hmm. conclusion. Argue with me in the comments if you disagree with me. Now, uh, if we compare our results to some of the previous combined probe analysis, this is what we see. So in red, it's our results. And this is again Planck. But then in blue, we have the previous kids' results combined with BOSS. And then uh, in orange, it's the DES uh, three times two point results. I think it's it that we are consistent with these two, but again, not very consistent with Planck. And if you don't want to just look at it in terms of what is the number, the S8 that we measure with kids is lower than the Planck prediction by 8.3%. So I'm just gonna give you a summary of all of the kids' core cosmology papers. So there's three sigma tension in S8, that is assuming platinum the CDM, when we compare our results with the primary anisotropy, uh, Planck. And uh, from our uh, combined probe analysis, we can see that this tension is driven by S8, so the universe is uh, smoother than what Planck predicts. And then uh, this result is validated using the mock mocks for kids and bus galaxy surveys. This is detailed in the methodology paper. And kids image simulations and plenty of null tests. That's in the Shear Catalogs paper. Spectroscopic photometric uh, clustering analysis, that's in the photometric redshifts paper. And all the identified systematic uncertainties have been folded through as nuisance parameters, uh, as was done in the Cosmic Shear and uh, Combat Probe. What is the next big photometric lensing thing after the, the three that are happening at the moment, DES, HSC, and KIDS? And what are you as an individual researcher moving on to next? Okay, so our first one uh, with kids, we have a little bit more area to add, but um, we also have a possible secret weapon, but we don't yet know if we can tame it. And that's adding another redshift bin, a higher redshift bin. It all depends on if we can calibrate the, that higher redshift bin, because if you go higher in redshift, you don't have as many uh, galaxies to calibrate against. Yes, yeah, so that would be the kids' legacy analysis. Hopefully, we'll have the six bin. And as I showed you, the higher bins have better signal to noise generally, so that could improve the uh, constraints by a lot. And because we are statistics dominated currently, we can definitely improve the error bars. And as for lensing in general or large scale structures, um, uh, you have LSSD and Euclid coming very soon in the coming years, and they are gonna be pretty much full sky. Uh, so that would be very exciting. And I think for them, the challenge is gonna be really trying to uh, control these systematics. Then might not be as important for these smaller surveys, the current stage three surveys, but for them, it's gonna be really, really important. And then for, for yourself, what, what are you working on next? Or is it just the more kids stuff? So uh, next year, I will be working on kids stuff, mainly. So the kids' legacy analysis. But after that, I haven't yet decided. I'm thinking about different things, maybe like a combination of lensing gravitational waves or trying to expand on uh, galaxy bias modeling and include intrinsic elements, beta galaxy bias, so all the astrophysical effects connect them to cosmology. Um, and yeah, the, la the last question that I ask everyone outside of your own research, what do you think is the most interesting thing in cosmology at the moment? Yeah, it's a good question. It's hard to answer it. I find a lot of things exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that give, can give you new physics is, I think, mm -hmm. exciting. 
Um, so you have the new probes like gravitational waves that everyone is excited about, but mm. uh, I think it's also exciting because it can give you new physics, like point you to new physics. Yeah, yeah. And I think all these H naught and all the tensions may are, I find them very exciting, and all the yeah. wacky different theories that people yeah, yeah. come up with. Yeah. Well, because there's none of the non-wacky ones fit the data, so it, it, it has to be wacky yeah. theories, a unless there's yeah. a non-wacky one that we just haven't stumbled across yet. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified. Uh, and click like to help with YouTube algorithms and share the channel with colleagues. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, while you're here, watch another video. The, the obvious video to watch is um, Marika's uh, colleague and collaborator, I guess they're both in Edinburgh, um, Ben Giblin's talk on, on kids. He went more into more detail about the cross checks and things that they did on the shear measurements. Um, and other than that, thank you, Marika, for the great talk. Thank you.